Good evening. You know, last week we gave an introduction to the book of Philippians. And tonight, certainly want you to take your Bibles or your uh, Bible apps and turn with me to uh, the book of Philippians. Tonight we want to look at the foundation for joy. And Paul shares that with us in Philippians chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. You know, uh, if you want to build something of lasting value, it has to be built on a solid, sound foundation. You know, you can, you can get an architect that can maybe draw up some of the most creative plans. Uh, you may order some of the finest construction materials available. You may even get the most skilled craftsmen to build your house, install the latest appliances and electronic systems, and fill it with the finest furniture. It may look great on the outside, but if it's resting on a faulty foundation, all you've done is wasted your money and wasted your time. And the same thing is true spiritually. You know, you could be a member of a congregation. You can, even, you can even be a servant, a, a leader in that congregation. And you can give the appearance of being a, a good Christian, always doing the right things. And from the outside, you look like you're the cream of the crop. But what about the foundation? You know, genuine Christianity comes from the heart. And our God is all, he's the inspector, right? And he's always examining our heart. And he's always able to see those hidden motives, those hidden thoughts. Can't escape it. He knows it all. Tonight, as we talk about the foundation for joy... Well, again, we're going to look at Philippians chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. And the joy that, that God offers, it's a joy that's not the outward, uh, it, it, it's not that, that outward superficial happiness that's based on good circumstances. It's a, a deep abiding contentment that is restricted to those who are in Christ Jesus. And so when you look at Philippians 1, verses 1 and 2, that's a brief introduction. It's, a, it's an introduction that, in all likelihood, at least many times in reading the Scriptures, we probably just gloss right over it, don't think anything of it. But it's an introduction to a book that develops the theme of God's joy. We talked a little bit about that last week. How that joy is a very prominent part in the book, in every chapter. And so, in this brief introductory, in this introduction here that Paul gives, Paul's sharing with us the solid foundation for that joy. So, if you look at Philippians chapter 1 and in verse 1, the foundation of joy, we're going to look at four things. Number one, it is... Uh, the acknowledgement that we are a slave of Christ. You see, the Apostle Paul, he, he opens up this, this book, this letter, by identifying himself as the inspired penman uh, of the book. And he's writing uh, while he is in Roman custody. And joining him in the salutation is Timothy. And Timothy is someone that, that Paul met while he was on his second evangelistic tour recorded for us in Acts chapter 16 and in verse 1. Now, Timothy was a young man. Oftentimes, I refer to him as the young preacher, and that's what he is. That's what he was. Well, he's a, he's a young man who was devoted to serving Paul. And Paul regarded him as his son, loved him. Notice in Philippians chapter 2, verses 19 through 22, notice what Paul says of Timothy. He says, But I trust in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you shortly, that I may also be encouraged when I know your state. 
For I have no one like-minded who will sincerely care for your state. For all seek their own, not the things which are of Christ Jesus. But you know his proven character, that as a son with his father, he served with me in the gospel. A very close relationship, and no doubt, uh, Timothy probably took some time to, to make a trip to, uh, to Rome in order to be there for his friend. To give him some comfort, to give him some support while he's in Roman custody. Well, together they're described as bondservants. And the word bondservant comes from a Greek word, doulos, which means slave. They belonged to another. And what Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 19 and 20, we know that Paul and Timothy belonged to Jesus Christ. They belonged to him because Jesus purchased them with his own blood. So they were slaves. And there is a difference between a servant and a slave. A servant is one who is hired to do something. And when they've done the task, they're able to go back to their normal life. And something else concerning a servant, a servant has the choice whether or not to do the task, whether or not to do the job. But a slave is one who is owned and has no choice but to do whatever their master demands. So there is a difference. And so the foundation for knowing the uh, abiding joy of the Lord is to recognize and to submit to Jesus as our owner, as our master. To submit to Him who has the right to command how we are to live. He has the right to command how we are to spend our time, how we are to spend our money. He, he even has the right to command how we are to think. Submitting to Him as, as a slave. And, and, and in our entire life is... Is supposed to be focused on doing those things that please Him. Doing those things that, uh, uh, that are in accordance to His teaching as His slave. Now, obviously, not many people like the idea of being enslaved to someone. I mean... A lot of time in a lot of places, there's not a lot of individuals who like to be told what to do. And so you don't like the idea of being enslaved to someone, but the reality is, the fact of the matter is, every one of us is enslaved to someone or to something. Paul writes in Romans chapter 6 and verse 16, he said, Do you not know that to whom you yield yourselves slaves to obey... You are that one slaves whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness. So Paul makes it clear, we're all enslaved to someone or to something. You're either enslaved to sin or you're enslaved to Jesus Christ. It's one or the other. Many of us, unfortunately, we call ourselves Christians but the truth of the matter is, we tend to, leave each, to live each day for ourselves, don't we? Think about how it is you spend your day. We even alluded to that this morning. What, what fills our day? Things of the material, physical life? Things that, in comparison to eternity, really are matters of insignificance. That tends to fill our schedules every day. How many times do we wake up and say, Jesus, you're my master. I'm your slave. And I'm going to do your bidding. At work, at home, or at play. How many times do we wake up and say that? You know, the starting place for experiencing God's joy is to submit ourselves daily as a slave to Jesus, our master. 
and to view ourselves as being on duty for Him. Being on duty for Him, listening to His voice as we're studying God, listening to His Word, and, and uh, listening to His voice and being quick to obey His command. The reality is, we're slaves. If we put on Christ in baptism, we belong to Him. We're slaves to Him. And we don't have a choice whether to do this or that which He commands. As a slave, we don't have that choice. As a slave, we do what the master demands. I suggest to you that there are many Christians who are nothing more than servants. In the sense they're hired to do something, but then when they've done that simple task, they go back to living their own life. We have to get that mindset clear. We're not servants in that sense. We're slaves. He bought us. He purchased us. We belong to Him. And our place is to do what He commands. If we want abiding joy, and the thing about it is, what did Jesus do? He, he gave us the commands of, of God. And what is 1 John 5, 3? His, his commands aren't burdensome. Everything that God commands of us is for our good so that we might have joy and peace and happiness. The second part to this foundation for joy is that we are to be a saint in Christ. What does he say? Paul addresses this letter to all the saints in Christ Jesus. Now, I don't know who might be listening to this lesson online, and I don't know how many may be new to the faith. But to those who are new to the faith, you may be thinking in regard to saint and sainthood that there must have been a, a few outstanding Christians in their, there in Philippi that it already earned the reputation of being saints. You see, that idea of sainthood, of uh, this, uh, being a state of a few exemplary believers, that comes to us from Catholic theology. And that's foreign to New Testament teaching. I'm reminded of a preacher who, uh, before the days of airplane, would travel by train. And he was on a four-day trip. I think he was heading to Chicago. But he was in with a group of nuns. He was traveling uh, on a train with a group of nuns. And the, the, the nuns liked him because he was, he was kind. He was a kind individual, a gentle nature. But he also had some very interesting insights on the Bible. And so... He would begin conversations and having discussions with them. And on one day, he asked uh, that group of nuns if, if any of them had ever seen a saint. And of course, they said, no, we, we've never seen a saint. And the preacher said, do you want to see a saint? And they said, well, of course we want to see a saint. And he said, well, I'm a saint. I'm St. Harry. <laughs> and he would go to the Bible verses, much like this, and he would show that every believer, every baptized believer, every New Testament Christian is a saint. Well, the word saint simply means the Holy One. It means the Holy One, and in, in fact, the word holy and the word saint come from the same root word, and you can throw in the word sanctification. Because all of these are virtually synonymous terms. Now, they sound very different in our English language, but they sound much the same in the Greek language. Come from that same root word. So, Paul writes to those who are the holy ones. He writes to those who are set apart in Christ Jesus. He's writing to those who stand out 
in this vile world. There's something different about them. They, 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 they walk to a different path. They're going in different directions. They live by a different standard. Their conversation is different. And, and you look deeper in everything in their life is different. Their families are different. Their business is different. The way they conduct themselves is different. Uh, and, and their fidelity is different. Conversation, everything is different. Well, brethren and friends, it makes us think that when we examine ourselves, if there's no difference, then we have to truly ask ourselves if we're truly a saint. Because a saint is somebody who is set apart, who's different, who's not like those in the world. And only by virtue of being in Christ, having our sins forgiven and washed away through his precious blood, can we be called saints. You cannot be a saint apart from being in Christ Jesus. Thus he writes to the saints in Christ Jesus. So in Christ Jesus is the key that unlocks everything. So when you talk about this foundation for joy, it's with an understanding that I'm a slave of Christ. I belong to him. And I don't have a right to decide what it is that I want to do. If God said do it, I've got to do it. And I don't do it in my own way. I do it in the way that he prescribes. But I also must be a saint. Set apart. Different. Being the light of the world. Being the salt of the earth. Being different. Matthew 5, 13 through 16. Number three, the foundation for joy is to be in the fellowship of a local church. Again, what does Paul write? He says, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi with the bishops and deacons. Being a Christian is an individual matter, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, what I mean by that is, you can't do for me... What must be done in order to become a Christian? I must do it myself. Your relationship with the Lord is what you make it. My relationship with the Lord is what I make it. So yeah, it's individual matter. True. But it's also a corporate matter. Why? Because we're not only becoming a member uh, of Christ. We're a member of His body. We're a member of His church. We're a member of a congregation, a body of believers. Now, the church worldwide, it consists of all those who obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's true. But those Christians, they gather together locally in a congregation. And according to Titus 1 and in verse 5, if that congregation is fully mature, if that congregation is what God wants her to be, then she's going to be governed by a qualified leadership of bishops and deacons. Now, if you're not actively connected with a local congregation of New Testament Christians, there are, unfortunately, far too many Spiritual nomads. They're just traveling and wandering from place to place. You want a foundation for lasting joy? Be actively connected to a local body of New Testament Christians. Membership in the Lord's church. If you are not actively connected, then you're lacking a very crucial part of the foundation for God's joy. Why? Because you are isolating yourself from those who can stir you up to love and good works. You're isolating yourself 
from those who can encourage you to godly living, and all the more as you see Judgment Day coming. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 24 and 25. And you know, when it comes to uh, being in fellowship with the local church, relationships among believers can be a source of the greatest joy. But on the flip side of that coin, it can also be the source of a lot of pain. And that's unfortunate. But I suggest to you that that pain oftentimes is coming from those who call themselves Christians, but are really just servants, and they're not slaves. They're not who they ought to be, and they're not doing what they ought to do. But still, relationship within a body of believers can be joyful, can be painful. I'm reminded of what's been said, and I agree with it. To dwell above with the saints we love, oh, that will be glory. But to dwell below with the saints we know, now that's a different story. And how true that is, unfortunately. It ought not to be, but unfortunately it is. If you've been a Christian long enough... You've probably been hurt. You've probably been discouraged by a fellow believer. And for some, getting hurt by a fellow believer, a fellow Christian, draws them and pushes them away from the church because they don't want that to happen again. We know that. We've seen that. But you see, brethren, if you allow somebody to hurt you, offend you, discourage you to the point that you quit and you're no longer part of that local body, you're no longer part of that congregation, then you're allowing someone to rob you of God's joy because God did not call us to isolation. He called us to relation with other saints. It's important that we not play church, that we be the church. That we be the family that God wants us to be. And so, the reality is this. There are only two kinds of people in Philippi. You know what the fact is? There's only two kinds of people here in Shepherd, Cold Spring, Cleveland, Livingston, whatever area individuals might be hearing this lesson. There are the saints and there are the non-saints. Only two kinds of people. And the truth of the matter is, while it can from time to time be painful to relate to fellow Christians, to fellow saints... It's really tough and it's really dangerous to be cut off from the saints and to be surrounded by those who care absolutely nothing about the things of God. And that's unfortunate that you would willingly push yourself and isolate yourself to be surrounded by things that will not encourage you to do what is right. In this verse also, you, you have Paul addressing the government of the local church, we gave mention moments ago, God intends for uh, local congregations of the Lord's church to be governed by qualified leadership. Uh, bishops, deacons. And in regard to your bishops, that's also translated overseers in some versions. These are older men who meet Certain qualifications, 1 Timothy chapter 3, 1 through 7, Titus chapter 1, 5 through 9. And I say they meet these qualifications, not that they met them one time before, but they continue to meet them. That's what uh, uh, meeting the qualification is. That not that you met it once and you're done, but that you continue to meet those qualifications. And this, these bishops, these elders, they're called what? They're called to, upon to protect the flock. Protect them from false doctrine. Protect them from bad leaven within the body. To give them spiritual food. 
Bishops are also called elders or presbyters. They're called shepherds or pastors. And there's always to be a plurality. There's never, there can't be one elder of a congregation. It's always elders. That means there's got to be more than one who meets the qualifications to serve as an elder. What about your deacons? Deacons are also men who continue to meet certain qualifications. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 8 through 13. And deacons are what? They're servants, they're ministers, and they serve the needs of the congregation under the oversight of the elders. Now, in Titus chapter 1 and verse 5, Paul was concerned about congregations that were lacking. Titus was to stay behind in Crete to supply that which is lacking in the congregations, appointing elders. Can't have deacons without elders, because deacons serve under the oversight of elders. A congregation needs to always be working for and praying for a qualified leadership, because that's what God wants. Now, from this verse, what do you also see? You see that the recipients of this letter, this was a well-established congregation. This is an established, well-established congregation, one that had demonstrated their love uh, to the Apostle Paul in his work and in his service time and time again. But then number four, foundation of joy is to be a recipient of, of God's grace and peace in Christ. Verse 2. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. This was Paul's customary greeting to those whose lives had been changed by obedience to the gospel. Now what I think is interesting. And I don't know if you've ever considered this before. But there, there's a Greek greeting and a Jewish greeting. You see here the typical Greek greeting was grace or favor. And when he's uh, addressing the church there, they already received the grace of God. And so really the request, the prayer, the desire was that they would have sustaining grace. That they would continue to live in such a way as to continue to be recipients of God's good favor and His grace. That's the Greek greeting. The typical Jewish greeting was shalom or peace. Interesting thought here. Do you think it possible that the Apostle Paul combined the Greek and Jewish greeting to show that in Christ there's no distinction between Jew and Gentile? Galatians 3 verse 28. You see some of the things that we might miss. We might Look at what we might have missed glossing over these two verses. What could possibly be in these two verses? A lot of information. Could it be that he's saying there's no distinction between Jew and Gentile? We are all one in Christ? Maybe. But it's the order that's important. You see, there can be no peace without first being recipient of God's grace. You see, grace is the root and peace is the fruit. Grace is the cause. Peace is the result. And there's something here that Paul addresses. And the only way to receive God's grace is by obedience to the gospel of Christ. That is by being baptized into Christ. And only by having a right relationship with Christ can one continue to have peace with God. And so Paul is very clear saying the source of grace and peace is what? God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. You can't, you can't have access to the grace of God. You can't have peace with God. Apart from being a saint in Christ Jesus. 
Brethren, there is a lot in these two verses. And I hope we're able to see if there's this much in two verses, how much is there in four chapters? Oh, we're going to ring it out for all it's worth. Because, brethren, we're living in a time in which we need joy. And so this is a very timely study. As we draw to a close, if any of us are lacking God's joy, then we have to examine our foundation. Number one, am I a slave of Christ Jesus? Am I living in total submission to Him, seeking to please Him at all times? Because if I'm seeking to please myself, I'm lacking God's joy. Am I a saint in Christ Jesus? Am I set apart from this evil world unto Christ, living in harmony with Him? Because if I'm blending in with the world, I'm going to lack God's joy. And I need to ask myself, am I linked in active connection, active fellowship with a local body of believers, with a local church? Serving together, working together uh, for the, this great cause of Christ. Because if I'm isolated from the church, I'm going to lack God's joy. So God wants us to have lasting joy. And Paul has shared with us the foundation for God's joy in Philippians 1 verses 1 and 2. So the question we're going to close tonight with is, are you experiencing the grace and the peace that comes only from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ? This time we're going to extend the invitation to those in this assembly. Brethren and friends, if you have any need, this is a time to address those needs. You have a request, this is the time to make those requests known. There may be some here this evening who have not yet put on Christ in baptism. If you are of accountable age, you know what God wants you to do. And you're ready to make this commitment to Him so long as you live in the flesh. Why not put on Christ in baptism tonight? Have your sins washed away. Having been baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit for the remission of your sins. If you're God's child but you strayed from the faith, repent. Confess. Be restored. Walk out the doors of this building right with God and ready for our Lord's return. Brethren and friends, if you have a need of any kind, we encourage you to come forward as together we stand and together we sing.